with the Egyptian guy who always give the world tours, you know? Yeah, it's great. I I don't don't send me wrong, but I don't think there's a lot of interaction. And I've been trying to collaborate with him. He said, just bring your people over and, you know, just we'll mention your group, but I don't want to, you know, collaborate because I wanted to do something with him on like Cleopatra or Nefertiti or, you know, because we're doing, um, you know, powerful women. The next one we're going to do is the, the Medici uh, yes. soon. And that, that's why I want him to do, you know, part of the powerful women, you know, is Nefertiti and uh, yeah. Cleopatra. And uh, good, so far, good to, see you. good to see you doing Roman stuff again. I, <laughs> well, we, we've been we've been doing it. I and mean, Greg did the last presentation also on Metroditis, uh, yeah. soft war. So we'll just do it. So Howard, yeah. without further yeah. ado, I'm going to be announcing this, but uh, let me just go over the rules. You guys know the rules, right? Uh, you know, just be respectful. You know, ask questions. Uh, yeah. Maybe wait for a, a presenter to get to some breaking point. We'll read some of the questions off the chat. We are streaming live, um, and it's you know, and it's like two on one, one on one, whatever you guys can you know discussion. Yeah. So, Howard, I'm gonna press the record button, and okay. um, and we're off. Okay. Well, actually, I'm, this is working out fairly well. I can see the chat. Are you so you're seeing my screen? You're seeing my presentation screen, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if if I if I mute myself, can I still unmute myself? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Give me a second. I'm gonna see what my cats are up to. When you let me know when to start. Okay. Was well, there four of us here now, or five? Or we got five, six people. Yeah, so far, but there's gonna be more coming in. Usually, we yeah. can start it. Okay. Start now. Um, I guess I can start. Let, what, let's get another five minutes, maybe. Hey, hello, okay, five minutes. Okay. What's my cell phone doing? Hello. Six people. Is it just me or I remember having like 20 some people in this group usually? We usually stream it as well. So I will read off the stream. So sometimes people mm -hmm. are comfortable doing the, you know, off the YouTube. And uh, okay. I'm going to announce it more. Sometimes I just need to wake up people one second. Okay. I'll just wait until you start. Okay. So I, I guess if, if people are, are come on there and their video and their microphones are turned off, they might as well just watch the YouTube stream. So you're watching, so I can't see the YouTube from here. No, it's fine. I mean, we, yeah. we can tell you right now. Okay. You want me to start? Um. Yeah, okay. Ready to go here? Okay. Okay, Scylla's Civil Wars. Um, I'm Howard Gibson. Uh, the meetup is History of Mostly Ancient Discussions in a Language. And what we're looking at is the decline of the fall of the Roman Republic. Um, basically, you say 150 BC, the Romans were a republic. Um, a significant population of the Romans had some say in how they were governed. A hundred years later, they weren't a republic anymore. Beginnings. Um, I was actually working. I'm responsible for the thing on Crassus, and I do this graphic for Crassus, but actually, it's 
even, if anything more applicable here. I was a little surprised when I looked at this, I to see how close these lies were. It sounds like Marius was, was way, way earlier than, than Caesar and Cicero, but he's not. These, these guys were all active at about the same time. Um, the Romans conquered, okay, basically during the second century BC, the Romans conquered Macedonia, they sacked and destroyed Carthage, they sacked Corinth. Um, and so by 146, B, uh, BC, the Romans no longer had a serious, uh, no, long, no longer, or at least apparently no longer faced an existential threat. Um, in, in the face of destruction, you all kind of have to pull together. The Romans could sit there and squabble with each other, at least perceive they could squabble with each other with some level of safety. I've noted the Gracchi here. The Gracchi are usually portrayed uh, as social reformers. What actually happened here is the Romans were. Um, um, the Romans, particularly in I think more in Sicily than anywhere else, were establishing large estates. They weren't handing out land to small farm owners. And Tiberius Gracchus got them pointed out. The Romans were not able to recruit soldiers. They, their army it was a citizen army that relied, relied heavily on small landowners. And this class was disappearing. Um, and he tried to and tried to organize reforms. Um, uh, he was murdered. His brother was murdered a short time later. The Romans were organizing mobs and starting to fight with each other. You can't do this in a republic, it's not the way it works. I've made a note here about the optimates and populaires. This was a conflict within the Senate in Rome. The optimates were the sort of upper classes and the senators and stuff like that, and the populaires were, were regular ordinary people. As we will see, this, this is an important conflict. Uh, next slide. Social wars. Um, What we're looking at here is the graph. It, 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 what we're looking at here is a map from, uh, I pulled this map off of Wikipedia. The Romans were the guys concentrated around Rome. Um, the Italians all mostly spoke, so obviously Itali the Etruscans didn't speak a similar language to Italian. They, they were not even Indo European, but they're all in the same general area. They all participated in the armies um, and they came back and said they wanted to be Roman citizens. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name here. Where did I put it down? Um, in 91 BC, a tribune of the plebs, Marcus Livius Drusus, proposed a number of reforms, including citizens from the, from the Italian allies. All the accounts said he was assassinated. All the accounts I found said it was mysterious. They don't know who did it or why. Um, and it says here the role, and my notes are that the Mars, the Marci, the Vestini, Apugni, and the Mar Maruncini all, all, all revolted. Samus, basically a split group. These people were all, uh, Rome is right about there. These people were all in this general area. Here. Can you see my mouse? Uh, no, we just see a map. Oh, oh no, you see we map? see the map. Yes, yes, we see it. Yeah. See that little thing going yeah, around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. We, we see it. Um, the, revolt, uh, the revolt took place right about here. Um, generally, these guys, the Etruscans are up there, the Umbrians in this general area, they stayed loyal to the Romans, and the Romans very quickly made them citizens. Um, the, um, the revolt was difficult because, of course, the Italians were well, the Italians were well trained, they understood Roman tactics and leadership and stuff like that. So they were tough people to fight a war with. <clears throat> Let's get move on and some more stuff here. Roman army. Um, I'm relying heavily on soldiers and ghosts of history of battle and classical antiquity. The Roman army went through a substantial transition during this period. It's hard to say how it went. Um, um, my reference states that the legion, man, manipulator legion was used at the Battle of Pydna. I'm seeing some other things saying this is really a reliable description of the Roman army circa 300 BC. What we're looking at here is Caesar's, leg uh, Caesar's legions in Gaul. This is a huge, there's a huge change here. The Roman, the manipulator legions were armed citizens. As a Roman citizen, you, if you, con if you controlled property, had some wealth, you could go out and buy weapons and participate in the army. If you were poor, you could equip yourself as a elite. Uh, they have these guys in front, typically with a helmet and shield. What do I got down here? Um, 
Um, if you're wealthier, you could be a you could be a hastati or a princip or um, and if you're rich, you could be the triar in the rear. <clears throat> Um, this means you get to participate in the Roman political. When the Romans held a political discussion, they marched up, they put on their armor, picked up their weapons, and marched to the plane of arms and held it there. And obviously, if you didn't have weapons and armor, you didn't participate. There also had to be the issue of social prestige. If you have the cool armor, um, if you can equip yourself as something better than an elite, you can serve lord over your neighbors and demonstrate that you're superior to them. So all this stuff matters. By this time, and we're talking 100 BC, the Romans were having a hard time recruiting troops. Now, part of this, um, I, I, I was noting about the lack of funding in the large estates. A number of accounts question that story. A Mary Beard points out that there, historian Mary Beard points out that if you hike from north, north from Rome to Gaul, you see small, you see small farms all over the place. You don't see the large estates. But evidently, the Romans are having a hard time recruiting troops. If you're a citizen soldier for early Rome, you can put the plow down, grab your weapons and armor, and go off and fight somebody, you know, 100 miles away. You're gone for maybe a week. If you're campaigning in Africa or in, or in Anatolia or someplace like that, you're gone for months or even years, and there's nobody around your farm. You're in trouble. So they were having trouble. Um, we don't know how wealth was distributed. It may be the people that the people who need to serve your soldiers just didn't have the money to spend on the on the kit. Uh, Howard, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I actually have read that uh, uh, the way the wealth the wealth was distributed is equally for all the male uh, of the family. It's not not like primogenitor later on in medieval times, uh, but that's exactly what led to the impoverishment of the population is that if you had uh, uh, adult children at the time the father died, the wealth is distributed equally and it, uh, as it went along, uh, the population increased uh, uh, prior to the civil wars. Uh, it's increased tremendously as a result there is an impoverishment. Uh, I also wanted to mention that there was a, uh, as this impoverishment happened, uh, there was a, a huge, the majority class developed uh, that were called property less, that were called proletari, and that's where this word coming from. Uh, it's actually, uh, uh, the measurement was 11,000 asses of income, uh, hard to translate it into contemporary number but if you had less than that you were not eligible to serve in the army at all because you could not afford any armor uh and, and that's what reform uh, of marius has addressed okay well your point your point is that is that the union is distributed equally within the family it's not e yeah. distributed equally within the overall society you've got a roman you've got a roman upper class that's getting very well right 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 right, uh, right. They, they, they wouldn't have a problem but i'm talking about middle class started to yeah. thin because it was this kind of distribution of the uh, wealth, uh, uh, like inheritance, uh, happened. That, that's interesting. That's an interesting point. I, I, that would that would explain why. That would also explain why we're not seeing the large, you know, like the, the largest state should be the. If you read some accounts, the largest state should be the crisis, and they're actually not there. But yeah, by by 100 BC, they were having troubles recruiting soldiers, and what Marius did is he recruited people from the proletariat class that were not qualified to be troops. There were several crucial differences. Obviously, Maris had to buy the equip buy their equipment. Um, if we look at these two diagrams, the upper diagram is an as a manipulator leaf. These are guys that buy their own kit and they serve in a spot in the manipulator leaf that's suitable for the kit. These guys are issued kit, so it's all standardized. You've got standardized armor, standardized weapons, standardized training, so you don't see these radically different units being deployed. Um, I, I think my reference states they don't really know how the manipulative legions were used, and we're not really. I don't say it's difficult to say exactly what was used um, during the period I'm discussing here. Um, it may have been they may have been had manipulator units running around on these battlefields. It's hard to say. I'm also noticing when I'm reading my I'm reading translations. I've got two translations of. Um, of Plutarch here, and one of them talks about about. Marius recruiting slaves as well as proletarians. The other one says they recruit slaves. Oh, sorry, we're just recruit regular, just 
They just recruit people. So difficult to say exactly who was being pulled into the army. So there was significant. The other really significant point about the army, about these armies, was that what, once once people started recruiting these troops, these soldiers were typically loyal to their general, not to the Roman state. So they were Marius's troops, or they were Sulla's troops, and this is an important. This is extremely important to where to where we're headed here. So just to uh, um, understand this, uh, and I always have this question. Always ask the same question. How would they know if you were a patrician class? Uh, was there a wealth requirement to get into the, you know, manipular, you know, le you know, legionnaire or patrician class or, you know, legatus or whatever it is? Was there a wealth requirement? And, and you know, how was it measured? If you were there a was a wealth requirement. Um, I don't know how reliably it was measured. Um, you could lie and bullshit. Uh, my guess is if you showed up with the appropriate armor and stuff like that, they presumably you had the money, you know, you, I, I just watched something on TV recently where somebody was commenting on, on, on seeing somebody drive a Ferrari and he was saying there was a guy that used to have a quarter million dollars. Um, if you can buy your, you know, to be a triar, you need, you need, um, you need the armor. You need a breastplate or, or chain mail. You need a helmet. You need a big shield. You need the big, the heavy thrusting spear. Uh, greaves and, and and probably it's got to be nice and shiny. You got to have expensive clothes. Um, now you can go into debt to do that, but that's and maybe people did that, but that's really risky because you can't pay your money off. You become a slave. Yeah, if I could uh, add here, you see, by this time uh, the patricians and plebeians uh, basically lost its meaning. Uh, in the mid of the fourth century BC, in three sixty seven, exactly there was a Sextian law that basically re reshuffle uh, uh, ba based on the wealth and uh, uh, power uh, the classes and it's created a, a, a new senatorial class uh, that uh, basically included both plebeians and, and patricians. Uh, so uh, the power now, now uh, because this Sextian law basically allowed plebeians to be elected as consuls and senators, you know, and by that uh, the there was a new uh, ruling class was created consisting of both patricians and plebeians. So at this point, uh, you know, we're talking about senatorial class that was immensely wealthy. They they uh, they didn't even serve in the infantry. They usually were other commanders or cavalry units. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it is the middle class, uh, or uh, what they call the equites, uh, that uh, some of them served in cavalry, some of them, uh, a poor one, served in infantry as triari, and, and depending, as, as Howard mentioned, there, are, there were like three or four uh, different classes of infantry, depending uh, on, on the wealth uh, qualifications. Well, these these guys in front, the uh, the velites in front, are are the relatively poor people. I also don't know what percentage of Romans could actually afford to serve in the army. These are relatively poor people, so they were, you know, they have a shield and a helmet and a sword and a couple of javelins or something like that. Yeah. Um, they also wore distinctive kit, so that when out in the field and did something heroic, they'd be observed and identified and rewarded and stuff like that. So there was an opportunity in in a war. If in this position, you have an opportunity to loot and pillage. So you can make your you can go here and make your fortune. Um, we're we're going to get to Marius in a bit. Well, Marius is the guy. Um, I didn't I didn't care if you check, but Marius has a pretty humble background. So he was kind of a working class guy, and he worked as he was at least low class by Roman standards, and he, and he worked his way up by quite a bit. He was a commoner. We go back to this. Um, Optimates for and populars. Uh, Marius was a popular and sort of, and Sully was sort of a, an optimate. So, Marius basically reformed the main thing, and it was interesting in, in Plutarch, um, Plutarch's discussion about how the troops recruited is basically one sentence. He just states that, that, that Marius recruited uh, lower class people for the army and paid them. He tossed it aside fairly quickly, although Marius did change kit and stuff, update kit. And eventually he would recruit slaves. 
Uh, you, you know, if I may comment, can you go back to that um, uh, where you listed all of the leaders, uh, uh, you know, classes and all that thing? Yeah. Yeah, you see, uh, the thing is, is that there was a senatorial class, equities, uh, you know, and, and, and there are lower cr classes, but whether you became uh, optimates or popularities, popularities uh, defending the interests of the uh, uh, poorer folks uh, and the uh, <clears throat> optimized the senatorial class, but which class you belong to not didn't necessarily designate where your loyalties lie. So Marius was popularis, uh, uh, Sulla was optimatis, then uh, Caesar, who was from the most uh, 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 prominent family that uh, goes uh, like of senatorial class and patrician and uh, because the clan of Julius, uh, that they go back to uh, uh, Eulus was the son of uh, uh, Aeneas. So, but he was a popularist, even though he was a patrician, while a Cicero who was uh, from the equities uh, class, he was not a senatorial class, he was optimatist. Uh, so it's kind of like distributed uh, for political reasons, like two parties, uh, you know, it's very similar to our um, uh, Democratic and Republican Party, I think, uh, sure, in I, the United States. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the Wikipedia page and they're arguing that you can't really treat these guys as political parties. I would note that the Gracchi were part of an old noble family and they were popularists as well. So it's a part of a general. Um, the really important thing about note about this map is that both Gracchi. Pompey, Caesar, and Cicero all, all, all murdered. Crassus was killed by the Parthians. Uh, Marius and Sulla managed to die of old age. That's an uh, important detail. I forgot to mention about that diagram. It was dangerous to be important in Rome at this time. Both of us. Um, so what's happening here is we have a profound, what we have it, it, with the Roman reform, with the Marian reforms you have is a professional army that's loyal to its generals rather than to the state. Um, we've changed in equipment. We're not sure how the changes in equipment and tactics and stuff work. And we got to Sulla. Uh, his actual name is Le uh, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Felix was a, was a surname, was applied later. He requested it. Uh, and we'll get to that. Um, I'm relying, I'm, I'm generally looking at the H. Clo translation because I've actually got it in paper. I've actually got a dead three edition of it. Um, he was of noble background. His family, apparently his, his, some ancestor was consul and he got into a scandal of some sort. So it was a noble family. It was an old noble family, but they were, in par, they were impoverished and not very important. Um, Plutarch did not uh, did not approve of the kind of people Sula hung out with. He liked the actors and buffoons and stuff like that. He was into wild sex. Um, he was definitely definitely low class tastes. They didn't like it. He seemed to he seemed to befriend some lady who was uh, some wealthy lady. Um, and at some point, she died and wrote up in his will. In her will, uh, he also had a stepmother who was wealthy. Um, he became wealthy as a result of this, um, and he was able to advance in public life, and he was able to accompany Gaius Maris to Libya to fight Jugurtha. Uh, the Jugurthine Wars are a bit of a mess. Jugurtha, uh, the Numidians were the guys that actually started the war with Carthage, the, the, final, the final war with Carthage. Uh, I, I think it's King Massinissa was that guy. Massinissa's son was Mika Mikitsa. Damn. There's no way I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Mikitsa had two sons, and Gertha was kind of an illegitimate son. Um, when Mikitsa died, uh, the three sons took over and kind of split the kingdom up, but Drew Gertha basically defeated the other two and took control of everything. The Romans, the Romans were kind of involved. This is the this uh, provincial Africa is a Roman province, so this is the kingdom of Numidia. Uh, the Romans were heavily involved with this guy. There was a lot of communication going on. The Romans were concerned about his conduct. And when they got too concerned, he bribed the appropriate officials. And, and they backed off. But finally, they land in an army. Um, this was fought in several. The war was actually fought in several stages. There were a series of battlefield operations. 
by the time Maris is sent up to, to shut things down, it was more of a guerrilla war than anything else. Um, Jugurtha generally avoided open battles with the Romans. The, um, as, as a, I forget what the student was, we would be calling her. Dun, 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 dun. I put down his rank, I forget what it was. Um, uh, uh, Sila was put in command of several of, of, uh, of Maris's units and he distinguished himself, he did very well. Um, he caught a lucky break. The guy, this is the thing, Meta Gonite is actually Mauritania. The king of Mauritania was a guy named Bacchus and he was a father-in-law to Jugurtha. And there was a difficult relationship. Bacchus sent troops out to help out Jugurtha uh, and they both got defeated by the Rome, by, by Marius in the battle. Uh, but Bacchus didn't trust Jugurtha. At some point, um, Sulu was able to rescue some, some Mauritanian ambassadors and he sent the guy back to Bacchus with some gifts and stuff like that and Bacchus was appropriately gratified. At some point, Bacchus contacted Maris and said he was willing to betray Jugurtha and hand him over. And the arrangement, the arrangement was that Sula would, would visit Bacchus and hand him over. This was quite dangerous because Bacchus was trying to decide, do you, do you work with the Romans or do you work with your son-in-law? So he kind of agonized for what he was doing. But in the end, he handed Jugurtha over to Sula, Sula brought him back to Marius, and that was it, the war was over. Marius returned to Rome, uh, returned to Rome in triumph. Uh, Howard, and, uh, I saw James wanted to speak. Oh, uh, yeah? Um, James, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? And uh, let me see. Can he unmute himself? Yeah, you can. I, I, we, oh, yeah, we, no, we, I, there is. I was just going to ask, uh, I, I, I may have, oh, can you hear me? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Yeah. Yep. But, uh, what, what is the, I may have missed it, but what is the kingdom of Numidia in modern terms, where, geographically? It is, I, I would say that's that's Tunisia and Morocco, and maybe a big chunk no, no, of not, Algeria. Not, not Morocco, not Morocco. Tunisia Morocco, and okay. maybe Algeria, uh, yeah. you know. Some, something like this. Uh, no, Mar Morocco they didn't get that. Yeah. It's a goodly chunk of North Africa. Yeah, right. Northern Africa, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Yep. Uh, Jugurtha had a history of working with the Romans. Apparently he served with Scipio Emilianus in Spain and stuff like that. So he knew he knew, he knew what he was dealing with. Uh, he was also surprisingly wealthy. The Romans would march up on towns and Jugurtha would have to remove his treasure from the town and stuff like that to keep the Romans from capturing it. But in any case, um, they finally captured him. They came back to Rome. But a Punic and... Howard, quick, quick question. Punic War-wise, how mm -hmm. does Jugurtha, Jugurtha relate it to Masinissa, um, to that very famous... I would, place him as, I would place him as a grandson, by the sound of it. Grandson, yeah, because there was this small kingdom that was uh, protected by Rome uh, against Jugurtha's war, right? I forget the name of the kingdom. Um <laughs> it's also in Africa, but uh, in, Ma Mauritania, maybe Mauritania, correct? Yeah, Mar uh, Mauritania is where King Bacchus was, right? Right, where the I don't was. think it was under attack, but he perceived that he would be under attack by the sound of it. That was his father in law. Numidia was split. Uh, when uh, do I have the king and war against drills? Just click on the link in my end. Uh, the war, uh, when Mekipsa died, he, he had three, he had two legitimate sons. I'm looking for the names here. Uh, there was a guy named Adderall, another guy named Hampsol, um, and the three of them, and, and these guys and Jugurtha split the kingdom up in three parts. Um, now, one of the guys and, and, and Jugurtha set to work attacking the other two guys. So these guys, these guys did, in fact, ask Rome for help. And in fact, I think one of them was actually murdered in Rome by Jugurtha. So the Roman, uh, there, there was a fight going on here. The Romans got involved. Right. And they, of course, mm -hmm. the, the, the Numidians are known for their cavalry, right? And uh, amazing horsemanship, you know. And, and yes. They, yep. They, that's, they were part of the, uh, Masinissa was part of the Hannibal's troops when they attacked Rome, right? Yes. Yes, they were. Which, uh, you know, marching around the desert on foot, it, you know, chasing cavalry is kind of difficult. 
Yeah. Be and awkward. also, Howard, the, uh, you, you, I think you briefly mentioned Scipio. Scipio. Uh, Emilianus. I think Scipio Africensis, the, the, the general, I think he was considered the, the second best uh, military commander uh, at the time, only second to Alexander the Great. According to who? It, I, 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 I'm the guy that did the presentation on King Pyrrhus. They actually met. Scipio Africanus actually met Hannibal on some diplomatic mission to Anatolia. And they had dinner together and there was a friendly conversation who the best general they thought were the best generals. And they had it worked out. It was Alexander and then Paris. Um, and then I think he rated, I think Hannibal rated himself as third. And he said, I forgot exactly how that worked. Um, so this yeah, was and, and, and then uh, and then Scipio Africanus said, well, uh, you would be third if I wouldn't have defeated you. Uh, because they the only time they met, they only fought against each other once, and uh, mm -hmm. Scipio defeated uh, uh, Hannibal. But uh, uh, by the way, that yeah. that dinner is kind of legendary. It's not a fact. It's, it, it's hard. Yeah, it's, it's Livy. I'm, I just found it here. Alexander. Yeah, yeah, but it was kind of anecdotal. He was impressed with Paris. Uh, -da, I would say, sorry, Hannibal rated himself third, asked what if he advanced Scipio, he replied, I should say that I suppressed Alexander and Pyrrhus and all the other commanders in the world, and Scipio was impressed. Yeah, definitely, uh, uh, you know, Hannibal would be considered in books as not above Scipio, but at the time, Scipio defeated him, and therefore, he, you know, in Roman eyes, was obviously much higher than Hannibal yeah. thought of Hannibal as a you know even though after the after yeah. the war Hannibal joined you know what's his name um uh, the uh, the Syrian um warlord um uh, to fight Romans and and actually commanded uh was an admiral of the uh navy yeah. he performed <laughs> yeah. he performed very poorly you and, uh, yeah. that was yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't his, it wasn't <laughs> right. His, right exactly it wasn't yeah. Yeah, that was, that so was, Howard, what was the what was the reason, Howard, that the uh, Hannibal, you know, in basically the biggest threat of Rome civilization ever, that did not actually take uh, the city of Rome? What was the reason? I, that's it's obscure. I'm not the I'm not the total expert in that. Number one, you take uh, Rome. Rome was had a wall around. It was fortified. If you think about it, fortifications, are force multiplier. So if I'm outnumbered 10 to 1, uh, if, I'm, if your army outnumbers me 10 to 1, I want to fight you as you climb ladders up my wall. Um, so Rome may have been defendable, and maybe he didn't have, he, maybe he didn't have siege equipment. I, he, he definitely did not have siege equipment. Yeah. That um, was one of the main reasons. Yeah. I had a feeling, my theory is that his troops were exhausted after crossing the Alps. Oh, no, that's happened way after. It's happened at least two, three years after he crossed the Alps. Yeah, and he but, already fought uh, uh, like three or four major campaign battles that he defeated Romans. It's actually Romans who were absolutely exhausted. They they have never suffered such a, a, a loss. They they practically lost half of their population. Well, not half. They they took they took they took one hell of a beating. But, but uh, don't forget, in ancient times, an army. I think World War I was the first major war in which battles killed more soldiers than sickness. So wandering around the Roman countryside trying to find food must have been a challenge. I'm thinking that, that Hannibal lasted as long as he did because, the, because a lot of the people in, in Italy weren't happy being ruled by Romans. So I'm, 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 I'm more along the lines of Hannibal did really, really well with the resources he had. You had Hannibal... In the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC, didn't he kill like 800,000 Romans? Or is it 80,000? 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, yeah. 80, okay, because I was going to say 800,000 is a little bit too too many in the ancient. No, no. 80,000. I'm going to throw numbers around here that you're going to have a hard time believing, and I'm not going to be able to back myself up on it. <laughs> well, the, um, the, it's, it's uh, uh, definitely was like half of male population of Rome. Uh, at the no. time, it's uh, a male war, population. We're talking about the army. The Rome was depleted. Uh, they they could only fight uh, defensive campaigns after all. 
but uh, taking fortified CD without siege engines, he judged that uh, impossible. And that's why he didn't march in Rome. Another issue is that Hannibal is really good at maneuvering his troops and picking really good battlefields. And that's that works out well in the field. But if you're attacking a city, your battle takes place at that city. You have to sit there and, and, and besiege the city. You have to cut off community. You have to park your troops somewhere. And, and they have to stay there, even if the enemy chooses to attack you. So it's, you know, if you're if you're going to besiege somebody's city, you need a much more powerful army. So would you say that Hannibal is more of an open field tactics general, um, or do you think he's more of a guerrilla tactic warfare? He was an effective general of the battlefield. He was good at. He was. It's, it's hard to tell. I mean, I, I, I look at these diagrams that they do these battles, and and their their intelligence, their knowledge of these battles is not that good. I mean, I, I believe that I, I believe the line attributed to Nathan Bedford Forrest was the firstest with the mostest. Um, you you deploy your troops, which you have massive numerical superiority at the key points of the battle at the battle, and the enemy gets smashed and defeated. And Hannibal's good about that, but that's you're in the open field maneuvering. Um, once you get, if, if this, just coming back to modern times, the Battle of Al. I keep seeing people writing about what if the Germans won the Battle of Al Amin, but they couldn't. Um, the whole area, the British in the Sahara Desert were used to being outmaneuvered by the Germans. So they fell back to a position where the desert was very close to the ocean and was no way to maneuver around them. The Germans had to launch frontal attacks and the British forces were bigger. They had more guns and, and that just didn't work. So um, Rommel came up, launched some attacks. It obviously wasn't working. He wanted to retreat and Hitler said, no, you have to stay there. And that allowed the British to go out and that allowed the British under Montgomery to fight a World War I style battle. You know, um, I, I, if, I, if I may add my two yeah. cents, uh, yeah, he was a brilliant uh, field commander and uh, outmaneuver and outfought Romans uh, in a numerous battles uh, uh, with a material uh, disadvantage. Uh, uh, in every battle, major battle he fought, Romans had uh, a much bigger force. Uh, mm -hmm. But the thing is that he, he was not a, a guerrilla commander at all because it's actually guerrilla tactics was applied against him by Fabius Maximus uh, mm -hmm. after the Battle of uh, Cana. Uh, and uh, if you know, there is this uh, a term now, Fabian uh, tactics, uh, uh, which means guerrilla war. That, that was the first time uh, it was kind of became solidified into the term. Uh, and uh, it was basically used against, uh, uh, against uh, Hannibal because uh, uh, nobody would want to fight him uh, he, he won almost every battle, uh, and uh, they tried to uh, uh, have an attack and then disappear, and they did not engage in, in uh, any major battles with him uh, afterwards until Battle of Zama uh, with uh, uh, City Africanus, when he already... Right. And that was in North Africa. Right. Yeah. So I think... Um... You know, we, our knowledge of the period is extremely incomplete. I would assume that if Hannibal positions an army at the gates of Rome, the Romans know where he is and he can't maneuver anywhere. You know, in the field, if, I'm, if I see a big army, there was a lovely lecture on, there's a YouTube channel called Lindy Beige. And he was busy ranting about how battles are actually very rare in history. And the problem is I have an army, you have an army. Um, we're maneuvering on each other. And if I know your army is way more powerful than mine, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to fight a battle with you. I'm going to negotiate peace or I'm going to maneuver myself into, or I'm going to get the hell out of there. Or I'm going to maneuver myself into fortified positions that, 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 that act as force, force multipliers. And also, Howard, two more uh, great his, history, historical related YouTube channels. Uh, more or less on the animated side that shows illustrations of certain ancient battles like Roman battles is one is, I think it's Invictus. Another one is uh, Kings and Generals. I've seen it. I've looked at a couple of those, but again, I am particularly when it comes to ancient history, I'm really leery about when people draw diagrams showing you how the troops are deployed in the field and stuff, but I'm really leery of that. We Right, like, but, but they, took from, they, they, took, yeah. they, they, they took it from reliable sources it's not like yeah. someone guessing game i guess um well what kings and generals claims is we have very de fairly detailed knowledge of the battle of pydna and we have a fairly detailed knowledge of caesar's actions against the gulls and we have very little knowledge of anything else we know the battles were fought and we know that some of them are huge but we have very little knowledge 
like in the Battle of Kenai, they don't even know where it, they don't even know where it was fought. I realize we're working with incomplete, we're working with highly incomplete information. And, and we'll run into this and we're gonna run into this as I go on. Uh, it'll, get, it'll get weird and complicated. Yeah. Well, it, it, is, it is the, un, uh, it's the bitter truth of history. If, if we're short or missing on sources, then we don't know. You don't, well, if you look, okay, if you wanna study the American Civil War, uh, it's been argued that the Victorian era was probably the best documented pe period in history because everybody back in the day kept diaries. Um, you don't have to sit there and speculate what 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 Robert E. Lee's valet was thinking. You can read his diary and find out. Um, there's just tremendous information. So diagrams and maps of the American Civil War are very, very good. But you have to understand that almost all the literature written in the ancient times was destroyed. It no longer exists. We've got a few scraps. Uh, we're in pretty good shape for Plutarch. Uh, a lot of Livy's later books are gone. Although I'm reading two different translations, it's surprising how different they are. So translating translating language is not a precise or it's not a precise art. So we're dealing with very. Um, All right, Howard. Maybe uh, yeah. we'll just move on, or if people have yeah. questions. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Okay, we're moving on. Okay, basically we finished the Jugurthine Wars. Our armies are back in Rome. Um, Marius is triumphant. But the Romans are giving Sulla a great deal of credit for capturing Jugurtha because it was it was a dangerous mission. He, he had a good chance of being murdered for doing it. Uh, Marius was not happy. Marius wanted the credit for the war. He he really. I didn't. I should have looked up his background a little more carefully. I believe he's a fairly lower. I believe he's a relatively lower class person from, from the point of view of class structure. Um. But uh, he was jealous of Sulla. There's an immediate consequence to that. But this, this will turn into this will turn into a problem. Um, where are we here? Dun, dun, dun. It's, it's significant as well that Marius actually replaced an earlier uh, replaced an earlier Roman commander. Marius, um, as I noted before, he was a popular. In general, when he gave speeches, and he just he did not like the Roman equite class and senatorial class. He felt they were he felt they were effeminate and unmilitary, and he accused them of, the, of this sort of thing at every opportunity. Uh, the, his predecessor was Quintus Cecilius Metellus Numicus, um, and this is a respectable guy. Most people, uh, Mar obviously, Mar did. Most people liked and admired him, and so this made Sulla look good. As, as, you know, Mars is pissed off at Sula. That made Sula look good. Um, right. Um, Sula was sort of a noble background, not very, not not very back, not that noble. The next big thing that happened back at Rome was the converting the two tones. Uh, this is uh, something I can make this work. Yeah, you can see the map here. The Kimberly of Two Tones, and and that that, that the Two Tones is German spelling. Oh, I, my Wikipedia link spells out as Two Tones, so it's they're German. They appear to be German, and nobody's really sure. <clears throat> supposedly there were three hundred thousand. Uh, supposedly there were three hundred thousand of them. I, I, I told you the numbers were going to get crazy, um, and. You know, we, a, we got to consider. I've got a history here of the Duke of Wellington. He was comment the they were remarking on how he said Napoleon the battlefield was worth forty thousand troops. Well, apparently the number people just use that as an expression. Oh, I've got forty thousand extra soldiers, um, and maybe the Romans are doing something this as well. But whatever, there was a huge population of Germans coming south, working their way south. I think that's 300,000 warriors plus all the women and children and stuff like that. And they worked their way down through Europe, according to this map, which um, again, I stick with my story. This is probably really, somebody's really optimistic about what they're doing here. But the significant thing is they fought the Romans in two major battles. Um, Norea was a pretty solid German victory against the Romans. 
Um, they were then engaged in the Battle of Arasio. They maneuvered again. We go down to what's now southern, I guess, southern Gaul. At the Battle of Arasio, according to my notes, the they killed 20, 120,000 Romans. It was one of the worst disasters in Roman history. We know almost nothing about the battle. It's very little documented, but apparently the Romans took massive, massive, massive casualties at it. Marius was called upon to save the Ro to save Rome, <clears throat> and Rome uh, re recruited soldiers. The Germans at this point decided to pillage in Spain, and this was probably a strategic mistake because it gave Marius time to recruit troops, train them, equip them, and get them ready to wage war. The Romans split into two groups. There was one group under Marius; it was in Gaul. And another group uh, under, where are my notes here? Um, under, what the hell is this guy? Come on, put, under Catul, under, uh, 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 Sir, uh, Sula was serving under Catula, so I think he was a Roman uh, consul at the time um, to, get, to get away from Marius. But they annihilated something like 100. They annihilated the Germans at the Battle of Arasio. They're uh, sorry at the Battle of Aqua Sextia, and it claims here they killed something between 100 and 200 thousand Germans for something less than 100 thousand Romans killed. Um, the Germans maneuvered a bit more. They came back down and they were caught at Burchale. There was quite a bit of maneuvering, and this time the two armies combined. So Marius. Where are we? Well, how, how, uh, what, what, year, yeah. what year was this? This is... Like what BC? Uh, 102 BC. 102, okay, so, so there's more casualty for the Romans, more than the Battle of Canine. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah, again, yes. Well, figure probably well, there were more, the Romans had expanded in the uh, the social wars hadn't actually started yet. I kind of jumped the gun on the social wars earlier. The social wars hadn't started yet, but basically Italy was a fairly sort of a culturally homogeneous place. I mean, a big chunk of them were speaking a non-Indian or European language, but essentially they, they, there was a military system in place. There were weapons and tactics, and there was an understanding. They were, they, there was a significant understanding they ought to be a unified whole. Yeah, I... This would, I could I just say yeah. a couple of things? As far as population, after uh, uh, the Second Punic War, uh, there weren't uh, many wars on the Roman territory uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the second century BCE. So mm -hmm. the population of uh, uh, Rom uh, Rom uh, Roman territories, they probably doubled or tripled. In addition to that, uh, when uh, Marius uh, conducted his reforms, and that just happened maybe a few years before the uh, invasion of Simbris and uh, Teutons. Uh, uh, you know, these reforms included the part of the uh, um, uh, proletari, and, and that maybe again double or triple uh, uh, of the armies of Rome, uh, because uh, all those people could not participate, uh, uh, could, could not be enrolled into army prior to that. So. That's why now the numbers are entirely different. Well, it's not clear to me. It, uh, the, uh, Arasio and Norea do not, were not Marius's troops. Somebody else was in command. When Marius arrived with soldiers, he won, the, he won his battles and took relatively low casualties doing it. The other thing is, yeah. again... Uh, I, he, I, he was at Aqua Sextae and then, uh, uh, and then uh, Versilae. Uh, he came uh, after that, but there was a second consul at the time, I yeah. forgot his name, who conducted the war uh, uh, up north. Uh, but once they crossed the, um, uh, the um, uh, Alps, uh, you know, the uh, Marius at that time uh, took over the, uh, they both commanded at that time. Yeah, well, I was headed there. Yeah. The, you're at Vercelli, the, the guy was, the other consul was Catullus. Or Catullus right, or something right. like that. Yes, yes, but and that he was had, second. And he had yes. uh, Sulu with him. But, he, but so, uh, yeah, yeah, but the previous battle was by uh, another council before Catullus. 
you're thinking, uh, where are we here? Okay, Orasio, uh, sorry, which battle? Orasio and Norea were not, were not. Uh, no, Orasio uh, was, uh, Orasio was before Simbri right. moved into Spain. It was like right. maybe a couple of years before, uh, yeah. um, you know, because uh, yep. then they spent some time in Spain and then they came back and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, with an idea to uh, invade Italy. And that's where the Aqua Sextile first battle happened. And then yeah. almost simultaneously up north, another battle happened that uh, uh, Sextaia was under Marius. They won that battle. They destroyed a lot of them, but not all. Uh, but Simbri, there was more numerous. Uh, Aqua Sextaia were more about two tones. Uh, but Simbri was uh, uh, advancing from the north and they went through the pass yeah. uh, in the Alps. So th yeah. there was a battle that they won, that the Romans lost. and. And, and once they uh, came to Versailles, that's where, um, again, uh, Marius uh, yeah. um, uh, took command. And by the way, Sula participated in that battle. Right? Well, watch, I think talk about it. the Romans lost Orasio and Norea. Then they won Aqua, Sextia, and Vercelli. Um, right. What actually happens, the barbarians separated. So the Teutons and the Ambrons advanced right. into southern Gaul, and Marius annihilated them. Right. He then marched over to Vercelli. The Germans were basically informed him they're going to give battle, but they're waiting for the Teutons to arrive. And Marius said, they're not arriving. I've given them territory. Um, I was actually, a, I didn't find it, but I read somewhere, supposedly there's a common Plutarch to the fact that the area around Aqua, Aqua Secte was incredibly fertile in the years afterward because of just the number of bodies that were in there on the ground rotting. Um, so Marius made it to Vercelli. And again, there was a bit of a new, they were initially, the Romans were badly outnumbered and they didn't want to fight. They kind of retreated carefully. But when Marius arrived with the extra troops, that changed everything. And so in the battle, I believe Marius had one wing. Catullus was kind of in the center. Marius was kind of hoping he wouldn't be involved in the battle. And Sula commanded cavalry on the, on the other wing, on the right-hand wing. Um, Sula was also given credit for sorting out supply problems with Catullus' army. Apparently, Catullus needed food and so and 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 Sula found it. So everybody was very impressed with him for that. Uh, Vercelli was a crushing defeat. The Romans, the, the Germans were not. Uh, he did capture German chiefs and stuff like that, and he just played, portrayed them and showed them to the Germans of Vercelli. So it was it was it was Aqua Sectiae and 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 Marius had time to get to the other spot and 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 fight that battle as well and that was it that eliminated the threat and again you know the, I'm quoting numbers here that may be exaggerated possibly wildly you know we don't have a good count um, marching 300,000 soldiers across Europe like this is is um, they, they starved you, you know how would you do it So uh, um, we got to take some of these stats of the Gary Assault. And again, the Battle of Arusio is not, the, these battles are not very well documented. They're just not well documented. But basically, the Romans suffered two military disasters. Marius took charge, and they effectively annihilated the invading, the invading barbarians. So Marius was the hero. At this point, uh, we got some sort of peace. We've got some sort of peace. Sulla was was now politically ambitious. He ran for a number of elected offices, varying levels of success. He managed to get elected praetor. Uh, a praetor is um, uh, I command an army. Or I can either command of an army can be elected magistrate. Uh, there was some thought. I think that they figured the Romans were hoping because the. Uh, Sula was friends with King Bacchus that they could, he could organize circuses in Bacca, and King Bacchus would send nifty animals for them to slaughter in the arena. But I don't think that worked out. Uh, what Sula did is he was sent to Cappadocia in central Anatolia. This is what's now Turkey. And his job was to restore Karen Ario Barzanis to power. Uh, he was having troubles with some subjects. He was having trouble. Yeah, a couple of the subjects were revolting. Um, um, Sula, uh, Sula didn't have troops, but he's able to recruit, recruit local soldiers and defeat the rebels and, 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 and put Arab Barzanis back in power. But what he's really supposed to do, they think, was keep an eye on Mithridates with Pontus. 
Uh, we were discussing the Mithridatic War a bit earlier. Um, this is the Romans were curious about a Mithridates was expanding, and we'll be hearing more about him. Uh, where are we here? Um, he was having trouble. He put down. He was also having, uh, some Ar Armenians invaded as well, um, and and Sulu defeated them as well. Uh, somewhere along the line here, Sulu was visited by a Parthian ambassador. And this is apparently the first contact between the Parthians and the Romans. Um, I'm, I'm responsible for doing a presentation on one of the outcomes of that one. Um, but it was, it was a first contact. So they returned to Rome. <clears throat> uh, King Bacchus of Numidia was hoping to place the Romans and stuff like that and Sula, and he dedicated trophies and images in the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus. Uh, one of these was the golden image of the surrender of Jugurtha to Sulla. Uh, this pissed off Marius. He was furious. He tried to tear things down, and there was a battle on between the city in the city between Marius and Sulla. Uh, this was shut down by the social wars. Now I, I plowed through this, and I plowed through this in um, in Plutarch, and I went to the Wikipedia pages. I've got, I was looking at Appian and stuff like that, and it's very difficult to keep track. There's a whole bunch of commanders and a whole bunch of armies all over the place, um, all over the place. Basically, the Romans won. Um, they didn't. They 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 didn't lose the Etruscans. They didn't lose the the, the Etruscans stayed loyal. The Umbrians stayed loyal. The Romans had the resource to win, but it was the battles were fierce. They were bloody. Um, the Italians were. Tough people to fight with. They understood Roman. They were good at Roman tactics. A lot of these lopsided victories were probably because they were facing people that weren't very well trained. So fight, fighting in Italy, got, fighting in Italy got nasty. A uh, significant element of the war is that uh, Marius was not very successful. Uh, he was getting older. He was getting fat. He was slowing down, and he did not. He did not distinguish himself, whereas Sulla did. Sulla was an effective, by all accounts, was an effective commander. Um, having won the war, the Romans basically granted everybody citizenship. So the Italians, in the end, after getting slaughtered pretty badly, did get what they did get what they were after. The next issue was Mithridates. Mithridates had now sent a couple of generals into Greece. Uh, the Romans decided they needed to defeat him, and they needed to raise an army and capture. And, and they needed to raise an army, send it into Greece, and conquer Sulla, um, and, uh, and conquer Mithridates. Marius wanted command of the army. Um, they questioned the wisdom of doing it. People questioned the wisdom of doing this because I guess Marius was getting, well, again, was getting old and fat, was not really up to commanding troops anymore. Um, but there was a battle going on within the Senate and stuff like that. And where am I here on my notes? Marius to be 88 BC, Sulla was chosen council, was chosen council with Quintus Pompeius. In the argument about who should lead the army, Marius was supported by a guy named Publius Sulpicius Rufus, who at the time was tribune of the plebs. Um, according to Plutarch, Sulpicius was a really nasty character. He had a couple of, he had something like 3,000 swordsmen. Said he had three, which I'm not sure what that means, are they gladiators? And he had a force of 600 equestrians, which he, was, which he referred to as his anti Senate. He, uh, the consuls met in the forum. He sent his force in. There was a fight. It appears that his, his force killed uh, Pompeius's young son. They didn't say how young, but he was described as a young son. Everybody had to flee. Sulla, fleeing this thing, apparently hid in Marius, somehow wound up in Marius's house, of all places. Uh, Marius conducted him to a back door, and Sulla was able to escape. Sulpicius, now in control of the Forum and in control of the Senate, declared Marius to be the commander of the army to fight Mithridates. Sulla, who was fleeing Rome, headed for the legions and reached the legions, where there were something like 35,000 troops. He then took command and marched on Rome. There were attempts to negotiate with him, but it, it didn't do any good. Uh, Marius tried to raise troops quickly, but there was no time. Uh, he was able to murder some of Sulla's supporters, but all he could do was run. Sulla marched into Rome. Uh, they mentioned buildings being burned. It sounds like there was some looting and pillaging. Um, Sulla then captured the, uh, captured the Forum and the Senate. He pronounced a death threat on Marius. 
uh, Maris fled, ultimately reaching Africa. He also captured Sulpicius and had him and uh, sentenced him to death, and then he executed him. At this point, Sulla had at this point, Sulla marched his army down back to the coast, got on the boats, and headed to sail over to Greece. The Mithridate, the first myth, the fighting in Greece was the first Mithridate war. This was covered a couple weeks ago by Greg, and I believe that's posted on uh, YouTube. Yes, yes. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going into, I'm not going any detail on it. Basically, Sulu won. Uh, he defeated much larger armies than he was facing. Then he defeated very large armies. In doing it, he did a very good. He he. He did very well. He also sacked Athens um, quite brutally. Back in Rome, the two there were two councils. They were Gnaeus Octavius and Lucius Cornelius Celia, and they fell out. Octavius was able to drive Cinna out of Rome. Cinna raised forces and continued fighting. Marius, who was in Africa, was told about this, and he got in a boat, came back to Italy, raised troops, and offered to support Cinna. He captured Rome's seaport, Austria. He pillaged the place, killing a number of people. And then he marched on Rome. Uh, the Romans mar murdered Octavius. According to, according to Plutarch, Octavius was a good guy, apparently. He was a noble character and stuff like that. But uh, the Romans killed him. Maris entered the city and set to work slaughtering enemies or anything he perceived as enemies. I don't have a count. It sounds like it was thousands of people killed. Uh, Marius was chosen, I think the guys are supposed to be lack of a chosen consul. This is the seventh time as, as serving as consul, and he died a few, like, a few days later. Um, he was, he, I think he was about 70 at the time. Um, apparently, I looked up Cinna. Cinna at some point wanted to raise trips to go to Greece and try to do a deal with Scylla. Scylla. Um, his troops didn't want to go. There was no opportunity to loot and pillage, and they wound up and they mutinied and killed him. There's an alternate explanation for why they mutinied and killed him, but Cinna didn't, la Cinna didn't last long. Rome was a disaster at this point between Marius and all the other guys killing people. There, uh, a lot of people fled Rome and headed for Sulla's camp, camp in Greece. Sulla made the decision to return home. What are you doing here? Made the decision to return home at this point. He uh, negotiated peace with Mith he negotiated peace with Mithridates, probably because of all the crap going on. I, I think he was eager to do it with all the crap going on at Rome. It was important to get his army out and head back. <clears throat> when he got back to Rome, he landed his troops. He landed his troops at um, Brundisium, which is in uh, where am I? Which is around. Oh, sorry, myth. Uh, okay, first, I should have, I should have switched my slide here. Or the first myth of war. He landed, uh, Brindisium is around here somewhere down in the heel of the boot. He landed in Italy and he had to defeat other with multiple factions. Mary's son was commanding troops. There was a couple other guys, but still look quickly defeats them all. Um, the note from Marius, uh, the Plutarch article on Marius points out that Sulu's troops were all well-trained and battle-hardened and victorious, and Sulu was an effective commander. Uh, the troops in Italy were largely hurriedly recruited and trained, and they weren't probably weren't at the same level. So at the end of it, Sulu defeated every marched on Rome, and he set to work slaughtering everybody he didn't like. Um, it sounds there was a lot of killing. There was at least one town there where they marked, there was only 10,000 people. And they were talking about judicially executing. They got tired of doing that because it was too slow. So they just slaughtered everybody. So we're talking tens of thousands of victims. It was real carnage, it was really serious carnage going on. Having taken control, Sulu declared himself dictator. <clears throat> Got my little timeline up here. Sulu declared himself dictator. As dictator, um, he set to work. I, I guess everybody, well, as dictator, he he ran up a series of political reforms. Um, he expanded the Roman Senate from three to six hundred. Um, these people were credited from the, uh, I guess, the Senate class is something over the equestrian class. So these people were recruited of the equestrian class. 
he already reorganized the courts. He, was he reorganized the courts. He's trying to minimize it. There's a whole, there's a whole Wikipedia page on, on, on the Sulin reforms. He was trying to reduce the bribe, uh, the Senate, the reform, the, the much larger Senate um, provided juries for the courts. He did not like the plebeian tribunes. These are the, that's what uh, Sulpicius was. Um, he reduced their authority quite a bit. He also did some re uh, religious reforms and stuff. At that point, he retired. He stepped down. He walked around the city without bodyguards. It's surprising nobody murdered him, but nobody did. Uh, one, one version I saw, a recount I said, said he served, didn't serve a Senate. Another one said he did. So I'm not sure what happened there. But um, in private life, he wrote his memoirs. Uh, um, Plutarch keeps quoting them, but none, none of this stuff exists. Uh, Plutarch refers, refers to him exposing his person publicly to the people walking up and down as a private man. Uh, and having got his affairs in order, he died. He was an old man. And that was it. His reforms did not last. I think apparently Pompey and somebody else dis, uh, dismantled all the stuff about 10 years later. So it was a nice idea, but it did, it, uh, it was a nice idea, but it didn't work out. We got here Pompey and Marcus Lebedus, Lebedus, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's basically it. And a Plutarch's description of Sulu's character was that he had rather common tastes. Uh, here. He had an uneven character. He was prone to rape and pillage. He was prone to handing out gifts and honors. He sucked up to people in power. He put on airs of people who needed stuff from him. Um, he talked about torturing, executing people for committing trifling crimes, forgiving people for horrific crimes. Um, upon his triumph in Rome after the Mithridatic Wars, he acknowledged he was he took some credit for skill, but he felt he was extremely lucky. Which is why he which is why he adopted the surname Felix, and that's basically it. Any questions? So Sulla, uh, to me, uh, what I've read had been raised in a pretty impoverished um, state, right? He wasn't. Um, he was His not. His family was upper class, but they were not wealthy. They were not wealthy, right? I heard that he lived in like one room, uh, yeah. well, something like that, and. Yeah. Did not really have much to, um, you know, uh, right. about. So it, it's interesting how he got to that to that level. Well, in a sense, in, in a sense, both Marius and Sulla were effectively new, or I guess what you would call new men. Yeah, like the in Russia they used to call them new Russians. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like um, about yeah. a sister, right? Um, and again, I, I'm going to the popular uh, series on Spartacus. If anybody watched it in Starnes, uh, basically, what's interesting is uh, they were portraying Caesar being, uh, um, you know, obviously a, a Julian family um, descendant, but having you know zero dime to his name, right? When he when mm -hmm. he ended up going to Gaul and then didn't really didn't really have um, any backing, and he just basically went solo. He became a counselor, co counselor and went solo, right? And yeah. uh, obviously committed gen genocide against several uh, Germanic tribes um, and then came back, you know, tri triumphant. But at the same time, he, he was triumphant, but he had no money, right? Uh, and he said that you well, had no money when he, when he had no money when he headed out there. Um, I've, I've got Terry Jones's book on barbarians, and he claims that all the Roman gold came from pillaging Gaul. Now, to my thinking, if you're Julius Caesar and you're in Gaul and you want to be rich, um, you're surrounded by people you can enslave. And he enslaved tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And Rome had a slave-driven economy. So the whole point here is in the, in the Roman army, if you attack the right place, you got fabulously wealthy. Right. That's how um, and, Carthage, right? That's how um, Carthage became wealthy, right? Through yeah. Gaul as well, you know, Hasdrubal and Hannibal, and then even their father uh, at some point. I mean, Hasdrubal was his father, sorry. Uh, yeah. Brother, I forget uh, what the name of the... The Carthage only had about five names. So, like, you pick a Carthaginian name, there's about eight guys. That, there were about eight guys that had that name. <laughs> I know. But it's confusing as hell. 
I know when you talk about the Carthage, right? You you, you yeah. say you know name Hanno uh, or uh, Hannibal, and it was like, well, that's not Hannibal that attacked the Rome. That's the guy that different one, yeah, exactly. It had a you know, and mo mostly Carthage was a peaceful nation, right? So to speak, it was well. The real sad thing about Carthage is that at the third after the second Carthaginian War, Carthage was was banned from having a navy from a significant navy, and they were cut back militarily, and all of a sudden, they weren't spending money in the military, and then the city became fabulously wealthy. Correct. Even after the yeah. uh, first, uh, so to speak, defeat. And I, I remember you, you were mentioning strategy, right? So mm -hmm. in the ancient time, there was no such thing, right, as strategy. Um, in fact, you know, uh, when Hannibal was in Italy pillaging the uh, Italian, you know, uh, villages, the uh, Scipio just sat on the boats and went to Africa. To attack, mm -hmm. yeah. So it was, uh, it, it was almost like if you would think of World War II, you know, Russia is at Berlin, and or Soviet Union was at Berlin, and you know, Hitler was at Moscow, and they're both fighting at the same time, which is not heard of, right? You would never, you know, uh, in fact, when Guderian was what a hundred kilometers from Moscow, uh, he asked Hitler, you know, what do you, what do you want me to do? And Hitler told him, turn around and go to Kiev because, and then these famous wars were, you know, um, this stupid generals don't know the economics of war. You know, they want to go to cold Moscow with no, no, you know, with no supplies and stretched out. Why not come back to Kiev, bread basket, you know, as we know, mm. Ukraine, stuff like that. So just an interesting aspect. So just, oh, okay. I've, I've got a book here on the American Civil War called Lincoln Reconsidered. It, it came out in the early 1960s, a whole chapter on military strategy. And apparently American Civil War generals, if they were interested in strategy, and lots of them weren't, were all reading books by, Henri Jean, by a French Swiss guy named Henri Jomini. And Jomini dictated to won a war by capturing the enemy capital. And, and of course, Hannibal, Hannibal and Scipio Africanus didn't read Jomini. He, he, he was writing them during the Napoleonic Wars. So they didn't necessarily see the same. So there was this European idea that there's this European idea that you capture the enemy's capital. So attacking Moscow makes sense, makes sense if you're thinking that way. Right. It's a stupid way to think. Yeah, well, that's what Guderian said that, you yeah. know, yeah. I am a strategist. I am a war strategist. We'll yeah. break, we'll attack, and then we'll decide later. But in all respects, you know, you had a Germany with 50, 50 million people attacking 200 million people nation, which is four times more. And the famous yeah. Stalin's words and Zhukov's words were that, you know, the Russian mothers would bury more children, you know, like they didn't care. It was mm. you know, they were all expendable, you know. So yeah. uh -huh. and when you can throw so much mass at the same time, it mattered, you know. Um, well, and, attack, attacking Africa, swinging around and attacking Africa does make some sense. It detaches Hannibal from his army. How much of his army did Hannibal extract from Italy to go to the Battle of Zama? He would have been commanding people that weren't familiar to him. Right. Well, you got recalled immediately, right? Here. Read up on read up the Battle of El Alamein. Uh, the whole, Montgomery's whole point was the Germans were better at tactics and better at maneuvering on the field. They needed, they, what they wanted to do was fight a World War I style battle of, of grab and hold. Um, and, and Hitler wouldn't let Rommel retreat. I see. So I had uh, to by the way, to the, the, during the, uh, this period of the uh, Punic Wars, I mean, uh, while Hannibal was in the south of Italy uh, and kind of uh, bugged down there, uh, there was uh, many other uh, 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 war, uh, th there is another war going on in Spain. I mean, th because uh, you know that Scipio basically went to uh, uh, for uh, started his uh, command and real fighting. Uh, he was elected consul, and he went to Spain. He didn't go against Hannibal in in, in Italy. It was no longer considered a, uh, a serious threat. Uh, but it's the Spain. He went to Spain, and that's where he fought against. Uh, 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 Hannibal's brothers, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Hamilton, uh, who, who were the skill, but I think you know, go, I, I can see that that swing not not engaging Hannibal in this. Don't forget, as Hannibal was occupying cities in southern Italy, I'm not sure was Hannibal pillaging or taxing. No, there was an oh, interesting there's, fact there's a gray, there's a huge gray area there in that distinction, but that being ruled by Hannibal is not I mean, necessarily worse than being, being ruled by Romans. 
Yeah, well, well actually, as a matter of fact, the, the, yeah. the civilization, who, who knows, uh, uh, you know, the Car Car Carthage could have brought maybe a, even a better civilization than Rome. We never know. Of course, we will never know, but uh, they were pretty civilized. Uh, a uh, very old uh, empire, probably less militaristic. Uh, yeah. So, well, but just, uh, you're a fact, Greg. You're absolutely right. They were the first ones that had actually toilets in Carthage, and had the pipes, and um, and they had that amazing port. At um, oh, actually... well, plumbing goes back way part. My an aunt of mine went and took uh, archaeology in university after she retired. And she wanted to go to Crete and study the uh, plumbing in Crete, in ancient Mino in Crete. So we're talking 1500 BC here. Oh, oh by the way, uh, a friend of mine, actually a relative of mine, he was out on the call today. Uh, and I, yeah, I always want to discuss something like that. Uh, they made a discovery today of, um, you know, a, a Minoan culture. Um, I don't know if you guys are interested. And uh, it's particularly said the sensation discovery in Greece uh, linea, you know, a new tablet for linear B tablet, right? It was this car, Mycenaean. Um, yeah. As we know, linear A and linear B is, you know, linear B was never deciphered, right? And uh, so no, no, linear A was never deciphered. Yeah, linear B is Greek. Yeah, yeah, linear A, yeah. Uh, we don't that, know Minoan you know, language, that's why. But they're <laughs> saying that linear A, um, linear B tablet was found in, con in connection to linear A. So it was interesting. So linear A would could be a Minoan, right? Culture. It it, it is a Minoan, is. definitely. We, right. uh, for sure. Oh, it would be interesting if we find something like a Rosetta Stone where it would be linear A and linear B with the same text. That would be <laughs> then we would get it. It's, it's tricky though because if linear B is Greek, then imply that right. indicates the Greeks went and conquered the place. The Minoan, as far as we know, the Minoan, the Minoans were not Indo European, were not Indo European. They spoke a right, completely right. different language. Yes, yes, they were not. Uh, and the only yeah. thing we, we have from Minoans is that Xena, Xenophon, uh, not Xenophon, uh, Canoxus, uh Temple, right? The Red Temple in, uh, mm. uh, in, in the island, Crete. Um, no, no, there is much more Minoan uh, uh, archaeology on, on the island of Crete. But yeah, that's the, the, the labyrinth. You're talking the, uh, the labyrinth yeah. in the Canoxus. Right, 250 yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the big one. But there are smaller, there are other uh, remnants of Minoan culture. Uh, I mean, the thing is that since uh, language didn't survive and uh, we never deciphered linear, but, but there are some frescoes, there are some I ideas uh, why this legend uh, about Minotaurus developed. Uh, I mean, the, they probably had some kind of uh, uh, different kind of like a corrido bullfighting uh you know uh, ceremonies there uh, in in uh, uh minoan uh, period yeah they said the minoans did do trade a lot with other culture and they said they actually somehow connected to philistine i don't know if that's true but there was now, a lot of the philistines the philistines are indo-european they've got paintings of minoans in egyptian temples correct and I've seen it claimed that some that there's apparently there is a minor they, they, they there is what may be a minor and axe uh, scraped onto the yeah the, uh, the, 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 the double, du double axe right you're talking about yeah it, uh, there's something and there's some graffiti at Stonehenge that looks like a like a mino and axe you know there's lots of alternate explanations for that but it's you know they they got around well let yeah. me just explain to people Minoan culture was uh, pre Dorian Greek, uh, pre Mycenaean Greek. In fact, uh, the culture had, you know, mostly predominantly was in the, in the Isle of Crete. Um, and the, uh, I mean, they said that Minoans at some point was, you know, was connected to um, Atlantis, uh, the famous Atlantis. <laughs> um, you know, people were thinking of it up as legendary. And they said it was you know, a pretty amazing, um, you know, uh, a uh, place to live and stuff like that. And then there was no connection to them, you know, see, obviously because of the explosion of the volcano, um, mm -hmm. which was heard, uh, I forget the name of the- uh, Terra, uh, Terra, Terra, Terra. Terra. Yeah, yeah, Terra. They said that the island had got destroyed and, but there's no um, connection to people dying at the time. In fact, 
they said that most of the people escaped um, the Crete to go to more Mycenaean um, mm -hmm. areas, which is, and Mycenaeans are connected to Homer, uh, which is what Linea B is, and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, presumably, um, so Mycenae is the one that part of the Troy, which is could have mm -hmm. could have or uh, didn't really happen, depending what Schliemann had found uh, in the tenth layer of uh, you know uh, the name of in Turkey I forget uh, Bakchoy Bakchoy area in Turkey, uh, that which is the, where the Troy battle would have happened, um, you know, uh, and obviously it's all hearsay. Schliemann mm -hmm. was not particularly an archaeologist, but he did destroy a lot of layers. To get there so i don't know if it was you know kind of like uh, now i've read lords of the sea which is all about the athenian navy um everything we know about atlantis comes from plato uh in atlanta in, in in athens it, plato was very much an aristocrat um and to some extent i think uh, the, the story of atlantis is a story in which the 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 virtuous land-based athenians defeat the nasty scum sea-based athenians i'm uh, sorry uh atlanteans um and what he was saying was that and, and what, what he was saying is that people with ships suck and people that stay on the ground are good um the people rowing the athenian galleys were working class citizens right. had to vote james yeah james uh, uh, put your hand up, up. Okay, can you uh, let me see? Up, he's clapping. He's, uh, no, no. I, was, uh, I was just going to say they also the Cretes uh, in Crete. Um, I've been there. Uh, I forget the name of the place though. There's the oldest flushing no, toilet. Nassus. Nass yes, Nassus. It, it, there's yeah. the oldest flushing toilet in the world. That's yeah. right. I, yeah. Well, there's a story of Canassus. You know, actually, Schliemann is the one who was supposed to buy. Uh, this area and ended up selling it to this guy Evans, who is a British oh, yes. British yeah. uh, explorer. And <laughs> no, no, I, I think he didn't. He didn't buy. He didn't, he didn't buy it. Right. He, he didn't buy. And Arthur Evans. Yeah, yeah. The reason he didn't buy it is because the guy who was selling him that area miscounted a number of trees <laughs> that was in the area, and then Schliemann was a shrewd. Um, I guess you know, our landowner. He said, "You told me there was fifty thousand trees. There's only forty nine thousand. Some really nonsensical, nonsensical stuff." And had lost out on the most important discovery of a uh, you know of the century. So I don't know if it made sense, but it was just a funny story. And obviously, Evans found it and um, didn't know where it was in the beginning, but kept discovering more chambers. And I think it was two hundred twenty chambers or somewhat. It was unbelievable. And it is um, if you if you been there it's it is um, unbelievable and it's uh it's just worth the trip if you're in going to mediterranean anyway to, to, to go and see it sure. right, right. do they think it was all built at once or do they think they started with a building and just sort of added things onto it you well, know it today, was built it's... it was built on the ground there were few yes. uh, levels going underground because of probably seismic mm -hmm. uh, activities uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much, how many, many, how much of it was underground originally. But today, yeah. you you go from chamber to chamber, deeper and yeah. deeper. Yeah, you go like a two or three levels down, but it probably would have were more, and it was much bigger. Of course, not everything is uncovered yet. Well, I'm I'm wondering if there's a building like that. Like I can I I'm thinking of like farmhouses here in Ontario. <clears throat> I've seen some old houses where probably what happened is somebody sell the land, they put up a log cabin and you know, the, your wife is screaming, oh, shelter. Uh, you put up a log cabin and then I, got, I guess the farmers either build a proper house a couple hundred feet away from that or else they just add, they just put additions on the original log cabin. So you get a log cabin with an addition and then somebody else does another addition and then there's another addition. And when the smoke clears, you've got a fairly chaotic floor plan. Right, right. So anyway, coming back to Rome, yeah. one question yeah. is, and I, if anybody wants to chip in and ask a question, uh, Marius, what was the necessity for Marius to set up a professional army? Why was it necessary? Obviously, we know the reasons, but I want to hear from you, Howard, Greg, maybe just throw okay. something. Well, the, Ro the Romans were running out of soldiers, could not recruit soldiers. They needed soldiers. Now, that yeah, was when, because... When yeah, when he was um, given command uh, of, of this of, of war for Yugurta, he, he needed to 
uh, uh, recruit a new army and there was no more uh, people available. And, and he needed to do this even, even before his reform. He asked a special um, act from the, uh, from the Senate to allow him uh, to recruit soldiers who were proletarian and, he, and supply them. So uh, that, that was, and then later on, he, by this, he realized, because, you know, Marcellus was very uh, upset about him being uh, elected a consul. He, he tried to prevent this. I mean, his commander, uh, he tried to prevent it. He, he actually uh, uh, held him until the last moment. He barely made it to election. Uh, mm-hmm. it, there was like in 107, I believe, BC. And, and once he made it, they, they made him, uh, uh, he was chosen, uh, he was elected as a consul, and then he started to recruit. There was not that much he could have done because a lot of troops uh, Marcellus uh, took away uh, uh, from there, um, and he needed more troops, definitely. And from there on, he realized that they needed a reform. There is, there is, no, uh, there is no way they could sustain all these wars and threats uh, without uh, uh, more army. And he made a professional army, uh, you know, that's the beginning of the Roman professional army that uh, his reforms uh, included uh, not only the number of men, but also now they were supplied by the state. Now they had standardized equipment uh, and uh, the responsibility for uh, 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 payments and supply laid on the commander uh, and commander could get this money from the Senate. Uh, or sometimes, in some circumstances, uh, uh, through the Roman history, uh, you'd, if he would be a very rich man, he could uh, sustain uh, a few legions uh, uh, on his own account. Uh, it, it did happen. So as a result of this, this actually led to the civil war, because as a result of this, you know, the Roman legions now had a, a, a allegiance to the general rather than uh, to the state. I kind of thought about that is that once you, uh, if you go back to the manipulator legions, um, if you're a Roman citizen and you got your suit of armor and your shield and your sword and your spear and everything like that, you you can sort of lord it over your neighbors who aren't as well equipped. It's your sort of, it's like having a Cadillac parked in the driveway. All of a sudden, you've got ordinary working class scum that you wouldn't pass time with, and all of a sudden they're equipped with all this stuff. So I would think at some point along the line, the the, the warrior kit stops being prestigious. Well, what is the case? It's all merged into uh, at some point. Uh, everybody, uh, everybody were supplied by the state. Yeah. It was a standardized equipment, and it was standing army. And now you were recruited for like I don't know twenty years uh, yeah. with benefits and and the payments. Uh, and actually, he provided employment uh, for all the, the lower classes as a result yeah. of it. It's interesting. And there was an understanding they were going to be handed land when they retired as well. Right, right. And then yeah, there was a, there was this land reforms that that was a big thing. After that, that was part, part of it. He, was he the, also modernized the uh, supplies he created. Do you remember Marion Mules? Right. Famous. Yeah. Let me just open up to other people. Let me uh, see yeah. if people can mute. Have you guys any questions? Anything on Roman history? Um, or any other questions that we have t- today we presented, you know, would be, uh, you know, would be welcome, uh, you know, also kind of like open up. If you would, um, if you would say which weapon in Roman army had kind of uh, made it uh, and the history, would it gladius, would it pillar, what was the most famous weapon that kind of opened the doors to them? creating this huge empire, what would be the weapon that, of choice? Howard, Greg, what would you think? Yeah, the well, short we don't, sword. The short the, sword, yeah. Yeah, the short sword okay, is obviously still, that's the way of fighting. You know, I, I would go with the one that has the most the uh, versatility in the most situations. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's pro- well, this is tricky. I still thought, I still believe in Shaka Zulu's rule. Shaka's rule, is, Shaka Zulu's rule says that I, if I have a spear and I see people I don't like, and I throw my spear at the people I don't like, they've got my spear and they're pissed off at, and they may be pissed off at me. Um, I, I think javelin throwing is overrated, but the Romans definitely did it. And they were faced with military formations that were, if you look at a, um, 
let's see if I can get. We're well, still that, running this thing. if you throw it, it didn't, wasn't it very thin and it will break at yeah. the. Yeah. It yes, well, Lindy Page did a video on this. It's going to yeah, go yeah. through you. It's going to break off. You're going to pull it out. Well, you bleed to death. I'm looking at, hang on. I'm going to go to my other presentation here. Uh, you're seeing. Oh, you're even seeing if you hit here. the shield, it will stick in the shield and then will disable the shield because so, uh, it will break and it will start, you know, you, you won't be able to operate the shield. The, the, the philosophy behind weapons is. I'm, I'm sure you guys know this, anyone who does martial yeah. arts, weapons in general are not made to be seen, but it's made to be yeah. felt. This is, are, are you still seeing my presentation? Yes, yes. yes. This is my peers' presentation. What we're looking at is a Macedonian phalanx. So this is what it looks like from the front. And obviously you don't want this coming at you. Uh, and this is what Alexander the Great and Paris used to win their battles. But look at from the top. Now, if I if these guys are coming at me, that's a side view, and they've used first angle projection, not third angle projection. Um, these guys are coming at you. Let's take the case that I'm standing over here. The Romans were what the Roman beliefs often carried was four or five small javelins about three feet long. And if I've got about five or six of these things on me because they're small, and I'm standing here and I start throwing in that direction, the, the shields provide no protection whatsoever. So the soldier, the advancing soldiers are lying on his breastplate. If I get him in the face or in the throat or catch him in the legs or the testicles, he's going down. <laughs> the um, and, and, and the formation is going to break up. Um, and then there's a good, decent chance of charging him. Um, the Roman pilum, I wonder how effective, the Roman pilum may be very effective against a very specific type of enemy. And again, um, Again, in a formation like this, uh, uh, the Roman palm goes into somebody's shield. The shield becomes unwieldy, and you got a decent chance of knocking it down and, and getting out with your own weapon. And I suspect the gladius is good if you get inside the formation and, and take them out at close range. The gladius is a very, a very close range combat weapon. Um, and the Romans prevailed against huge odds against phalanxes. Um, they seem to have they seem to been less effective against the Germans and the Gauls. The, the, the gladius is actually a Gallic weapon, it wasn't a Roman weapon, right? It was, uh, I, I, there's a lot of things that they uh, did. Um, you know, Etruscan gave him the gladiator fighting, the Gauls gave him, you know, gladi gladius. Yeah. There's so much that they have taken over, you know, they have taken stuff from some knights. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, it's just unbelievable. It's a like Romanist combination, and there's really nothing original yeah. that comes from them. But looking, looking at this phalanx here, it looks to me like if I'm standing here and throwing javelins obliquely, I'm I'm going to wreak havoc. Oh. And remember, in a massive phalanx, your your shield is kind of hanging. You got a strap around your neck, and the thing is kind of attached to your arms. You can't. You you, you need both hands to hold that spear. The, the, those things are called sarissas. You need both hands. You really can't manipulate the shield. The, the Roman scutum, you held it with one hand. You could swing it around and deflect it. There was a lot you could do with it. You could swing it around and deflect attacks. Right. And I, so also, I was also like to mention that uh, pikesmen, uh, you know, you guys know pikesmen in the yeah. uh, medieval ages and during the yeah. Renaissance. It's, it's not, of course, there are some differences, but it's not too different in principle to the diagrams that you're showing us, especially what yeah. the, the one on the left um it's it's how do i say this it didn't exactly go out of style or in terms of uh, field effectiveness uh until until firearms got evolved to a certain point which lasted a damn long time right exactly well yeah. what actually happened i've got a book on european warfare which i haven't sat down read yet carefully the basically what happened in europe the pikes the significance what happened in europe is that the whole point of knightly combat was that the, your military were your armed nobility. Uh, you need to be rich to, 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 to hoard. You needed a horse, a suit of armor, a helmet, a sword, a knife, a lance, a squire, and a couple of followers to go to war. And if you couldn't afford that, you weren't, you weren't military. Again, what we see is a transition from an armed nobility to mass infantry. And pikes are effective. You know, if you're on horseback, you're not charging into that formation. That, that Macedonian phalanx is impenetrable by, by horse. Well, um, by the way, Howard, 
remember you yeah. people said the peers used elephants uh, as part yeah. of the tanks of their toast times. How did the Romans fight against elephants? What, what did they do? We're not sure. Um, we're actually not sure. I, I didn't do the book here. Hang on. Yeah, um, well, from my reads, uh, they used to uh, put the nails uh, into the, uh, some uh, wood and put it, uh, 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 you know, and, try and put it in front. So when they step, uh, elephants step on that, they would get frightened and run back. That was one of the way out of this. Yeah. I see. Um, they also built, they also had some kind of a, supposed they built some kind of a wagon that was pushed from behind by a couple of oxen that did stuff. They're not sure. Um, I mean, elephants are just anim they're animals. If you frighten them, they stampede and they go back over your own troops and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was they're difficult to breed in uh, captivity. Also, also yeah. the very loud tubes, they use this sound to scare any, uh, elephants. And that would become a That's I, what they, we, they did at the Battle of Zama. I mean, that, that was one of the things. When I did my presentation on Pyrrhus, um, I brought the subject of American tactics in Pacific and World War II. They went up against Mitsubishi Zeros. They were told not to dogfight them. Um, and it dawned on me sometime later. It's actually a better example. During the the, the Scottish revolts in 1747, the British troops panicked and ran when they're faced with a Highland charge. You got all these guys wearing kilts with claymores running down at you, screaming, waving claymores and axes around. You drop your weapon and run. Um, at Colum, the British troops were told to maintain position and they were told to stab the guy to your right. Oh, wow. Oh, talking don't about. Stab the guy. Don't stab the guy in front of you. Stab to your right. Maintain formation and stab off to the right. And the idea here was that the shield was in his left hand and he can't get the shield in position to protect himself. Talking about that, if the elephants went berserk, wasn't there a rider called Mahu that was allowed to kill the elephant that was riding? I think they would do that, but in the heat of battle, can you? Do, what if you've been knocked off it or someone got you with a spear? Yeah, they had it. The Indians had it. Uh, uh, I, I'm, yeah. not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure that uh, Europeans had the same thing. Right. I see. Let me know this thing here. I'm trying to where the hell I was. Uh, uh, or or, or uh, Carthage, no, no, not your uh, yeah. Uh, not, uh, not, not the Pyrrhus, right? Maybe Carthage. Right. Food. I I don't know. I don't know. But the Indians had that practice. Yeah. Well, well, maybe they. My notes here. It's interesting. Did the, uh, you know, when you guys asked me this, I looked up elephants. I didn't. Uh, these are my notes. I don't have anything here. Um, there what um. We don't know what they do with the. Don't forget, this is a North. Af I think, no, they were using Indian. Uh, Paris is using Indian elephants. Hannibal is using North African elephants. Right, right. Yeah, they were smaller, and and, yeah. and, 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 and they don't no longer exist. But yeah, yeah. they did. They did exist in the time. Uh, one thing about elephants I really don't like in ancient warfare history that is portrayed in movies, overly sized. Um. The ones, the ones in The Hobbit are enormous, or the ones in Return of the King are, are way bigger. But that book's more, I mean, everything in, in there is exaggerated. I see. So they do, they, they would do that. Um, yeah, so uh, what I wanted to do is uh, take a couple of minutes, uh, talk about our upcoming um, yeah. stuff. So for the uh, Romans, we're going to take a little hiatus. Um, mm -hmm. because Beverly is going to be presenting on Latin language in Rome uh, in May, uh, May 27th. Um, and after that, we do look for more presenters, uh, particularly the domination of Pompey, you know, the, the famous triumvirate and, you know, domination of Pompey, and then Spartacus. And anybody wants to step up, <laughs> uh, do Spartacus, you know, to be awesome. Beverly is going to do Latin language next time. It will be a next Roman presentation. We do have mm -hmm. other presentations this Thursday. Uh, for example, Richard continue his Middle Eastern uh, mm -hmm. series, and he's going to talk about um, uh, particularly, um, it's called the Maghreb region of the 19th century. Um, so he's going to talk about you know ancient Persia, uh, ancient Persia, medieval Persia, Ottoman mm -hmm. Empire. Then, uh, well, actually, uh, that would be this Thursday. And then on Saturday next week, we have Catherine de Medici and her wayward daughter. Um, uh, you know, so please join us. This is a series of powerful women. 
Um, and it would be Jane that's going to be presenting that one. And uh, we have other exciting ones. If you do want to uh, look at our schedule, like I said, you can you know check out our um, uh, history, uh, most ancient. I'll post up the schedule as well. But uh, the other series, like I said, let me just go through a couple of more stuff that there that we have. We do have we will will have in person event going to the uh, arms and armor museum, uh, Metropolitan Museum, following our hundred year war. Uh, we will have a writer, um, his name is Mike, who I was able to help uh, publish the book. Not, I didn't help publish the book, but I put him together with a publisher, and he's published a book on London Revolution 1640 and 1643. He's going to be presenting that on April 30th. Uh, April 24th, we're going to talk about European defense and European Union politics, so do join that one. Um, and... Uh, uh, like I said, visit the Metropolitan Museum would be on May 1st, um, you know, and then uh, we'll see. But, uh, you know, we will do actually a reenactment series in person and uh, maybe next to the Cloister Museum with Sergio. It's called Life of a Roman Soldier and a reenactment presentation. And, uh, you know, and, you know, on March 15th, we also will try to do Qing Dynasty which keeps getting proposed, actually March, uh, I'm sorry, May 14th, sorry, May 14th, Qing Dynasty. So we'll see, it keeps getting postponed, hopefully we'll do that one. And then one of the really good presentations we'll have is on the, uh, um, and I'm looking like a for co-presenter um, is the man, it, it's, uh, it's called, um, name of the presentation exactly, uh, Patrick, was supposed to present, but I think it dropped out. And so I'm looking for a co-presenter for that. It's called Give a Flight of Ma Manichian Theology um, or Scripture of Gnosis. So if anybody wants to co-present with Richard and me, we'll, you know, we'll definitely, particularly we're looking for somebody who is, in, who is interested in learning about uh, Manichian the the theology, uh, mm -hmm. Manichism. So uh, that's, that's that. And then we'll do literature you know, ancient literature, which is Marcus Aurelius, somewhere in June. Uh, we'll have really a lot of exciting presentations. And then I'm also going to be announcing a couple of really good in-person events uh, coming up, um, you know, going to Metropolitan Museum. We will have an event where we'll visit in Washington. Um, the uh, It's called Embassy Night. We'll try different foods, you know, like different embassies, like Azerbaijani Embassy, Ukrainian Embassy, you know, Swedish embassy and we'll try different foods and just hang out and get to know each other. I'll post that up. It's in combination with Robert. So if you guys want, you know, can organize kind of like a trip to Washington and enjoy uh, that mm -hmm. trip. So we'll, we'll have that together and, you know, we'll post up other interesting in-person events. So uh, further ado, if anybody any other questions or want to discuss anything else, let me know. If not, uh, well, James wanted to say something. Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask uh, where do you, when you say these will be posted, um, it, it's I usually get them just by the usual emails. Is it is it wait you you imply that, that it's posted somewhere schedule? Which one? Ah, the uh, you mean like all these events are already posted on the uh, um, on our history most ancient, uh, which you're part of the group and. Uh, but the, is, it, is it a, a, a meetup? Yes. Or, yes, oh. yes. Yeah, it's a meetup, yeah. It's yeah. You just go to meetup, uh, history, most ancient, and you look, everything is. Oh, I see. Out. That's right. Look at the you know, I, I, very, I very much like to go to myself to the, the, the Met Museum and down to the Washington. You do? Okay. So I will, yeah. uh, I will also, when I post it, I'll make sure that, you know, I'll, um, I'll send you an email. And I'll forward the emails to people that of the itinerary. I'll try to organize a bus tour so we, maybe we can, you know, stop by, have like a nice lunch, and then you know, I don't know, we'll see. You know, count I, me in. Yeah. Amir, are you coming? Uh, Amir. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm too far away for that. Don't yeah. forget if you if you if you have a bus and you and if you have a bus and the bus goes to a restaurant, the driver eats for free generally. <laughs> yep. You coming I'm, from I'm an organizer with a ski club. I was I was I was I was organizing the first dinner trip I was involved in. I told the driver I was gonna pay for his lunch and he laughed at me. I was gonna pay for his dinner and he laughed at me. 
Oh, speaking of food, I just want to mention this. I, I think a lot of us here already know this, but it's just because I, you know, Roman Empire built around the Mediterranean Sea, which is pretty strategic in my opinion, right? But uh, Mediterranean diet is also really tasty and actually quite healthy, proven by medical science. And they actually ha also have a lot of uh, Indian influence. <laughs> Because yeah. I'm remembering the both Caesar, like the one that got snapped Caesar, and then later on the Emperor Caesar, um, and as well as much later, they, they traded, I think from Alexandria, came out of the Red Sea and went to India and came back over and over for spices, right? And so, so that's why Mediterranean food actually do have some resemblance when it comes to Indian cuisine. Well, just to tell you a story, there was this called the garment sauce, which is if I tell you how it's made and, and in Rome it you was garum? Used, yeah. I think it it's was, garum. Garum. So they used to take a fish, fish remaining, fish heads, and they leave it in rotten in the sun <laughs> and it turned into a liquid. And they would sp spray it on their food to eat because that's that's right now, if you look at it, apparently somewhere in Vietnam they still do that. You I know mean yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they do, that. I've got a book, so I've got a magazine article somewhere in Roman cooking. Um, someone's pretty cr stuffed dormice. Um, oh. but no. garum, garum was a huge Roman business, they made tons of stuff, they made tons of the stuff, they transported all of the empire. That's right, that's right. So however gross it sounds, I don't know about Roman cooking, Howard, but I know this is uh, almost an entire two millennia apart from the history that we were talking about today, but. If anyone really wants a good channel for for cooking, but not modern day or so, I highly recommend a YouTube channel called Townsend's. It is, uh, oh, it is that, Town, yeah. Townsend's is a channel that dedicates on the, I think the, uh, I believe the 18th century I, cooking. I have Every watched 18th that century. channel. I have watched that channel and I've learned to make Melton Mowbray pies. My, my favorite thing is still the, um, a pound of meat hanging on a rope over roast over fire roasted yeah. meat yeah it's really good <laughs> you, you better not be a vegan though <laughs> <laughs> well mount my brought the mountain mowbray is a pork pie so it's also not it's not halal or or, or kosher so but they're delicious i love it i don't keep kosher man drag <laughs> 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 <Greg are> cool <laughs> me <and Greg> <laughs> We, as, as my friend would say, uh, he's an Ashkenazi Jew coming from uh, Ukraine. He goes, the only concession I will make, I would not eat pork during Passover. <laughs> really? you, you guys, I, I wouldn't even make that concession. <laughs> I, I, collect, I collect old books here. Um, can you read that? Are those yeah. old culinary arts book, Howard? Yes. Well, I think one of them is domestic cookery and the other one, I'm it's 1823. This is domestic economy, which has uh, recipes on how to make beer, which I'm really tempted to try. What, what century modern, is this from? <laughs> modern domestic cookery is eight. Oh, it's even older. It's 1819. So, you know, I, I haven't tried a lot of this stuff. I really got to sit down and try it. Some of these recipes, but they do have a home brewery. Well, apparently, the uh, it's interesting that Egyptian beer resembled kind of like our beer a little bit. They had um, all the ingredients, but maybe, maybe un unfiltered. Uh, the one uh, that is unfiltered, yeah. I thought, but I the thought it was quite beer, different. Whatever. It, it was just a concoction of this barley made <laughs> yeast, in <laughs> fact, you know, <laughs> type of concoction that they would put a straw in it and they'll drink, and that would be there <laughs> instead of water. They would drink that. In yeah. Some uh, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a meal. You know, yeah, I would say the Mesopotamians drank beer as well. I thought the Egyptians put all kinds of extra sugar and stuff into it, though, and they spiced it. And I don't know how true it is. They said that the pyramid workers, and I know how true it is, they were not slaves. They were paid in beer, and they were seasonal workers. Uh, uh, that sounds about right to me. No, yeah. that, that. Wait a minute. People who yeah, made so that... pyramids were not slaves. They, no, they yeah. weren't. Yeah, yeah. The, now, now they believe they were. They were not. This is the, the well, Egyptians, What kind of proof do we have? I don't think the Egyptians had money as we understand it. So the distinction between a slave and a worker is really complicated. It was a command economy. Um, so you didn't have commercial slavery the way you did with the like. If you have a slave, um, the slave's worth a thousand dollars, 
um, it, it's a commercial thing. I, I, the Egyptians weren't capable of that, but they were they were workers. They 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 they've uncovered the uh, town that the, the workers lived in. The towns were pretty prosperous. The workers had decent yeah. homes. Yeah, the they, lifestyles. They yeah, uh, yeah, they have. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there are a lot of programs <clears throat> about that. Now. Yeah, I mentioned the Athenian Navy. Uh, using slaves to row your boats was invented by the Spanish in the 16th century. Ancient galleys were rowed by highly trained professional sailors. And think about it. You, want, you don't want a slave rowing, rowing your galley. You want some big muscle-bound guy that can help defend the ship if necessary. Yeah, but it's interesting. Well, actually, what you want is a short muscle-bound guy. Egyptians were extremely kinky, and they said there was very, like, you know, um, they thought of Egyptian because of the Book of the Dead. There was very gloomy society. It was not actually. They were extremely sexualized, very kinky because of the found uh, Turin papyrus. I don't know if you guys ever heard of it. That was found in the um, uh, village Maghreb. Um, I forget the name of the uh, area, but they're explaining in those towns that were building the uh, pyramids how they lived. And apparently... Um, there was no such thing as marriage, right? They were just the two people instead of having a wedding or just got back together and lived together and stuff like that. And uh, they have a pretty open relationship. They could have sexual relationship with, in fact, there's a one person uh, is explained that he had a sexual relationship with a mother and later had a sexual relationship with, with a mother's daughter. So, and it's explained in this papyrus, Turin papyrus, and they have all this caricature, very sexualized caricatures in Egypt, in, in that uh, Turin papyrus, where they almost making fun of the uh, Egyptian bureaucracy and, and pharaohs uh, by looking at how they, and I mean, it's compl uh, completely unimaginable. They always, they have a person um, having, trying to have relations with a woman while she's on the uh, chariot, trying to run away from him. Like, so it's impossible mm -hmm. type of kind of behavior. Uh, so it's interesting. The Egyptians were a very colorful society. In fact, well, some of the Romans, the Romans had, I, I've got a thing here on, on ancient artifacts, and there's a picture of a cup with a guy having sex with a young boy. And meanwhile, a slave is looking into the door. Um, so the, the Romans were into it as well. When you mentioned about somebody uh, having uh, a relationship with their daughter, uh, or, um, that could be if the first person in that relationship has died. That wouldn't be too uncommon. Well, we certainly know that the Ro Roman pharaohs, they, they, they were marrying their oldest uh, daughters. That was part yeah. of the uh, yeah. tradition. And that wasn't, that wasn't just the Tommies. That, was, uh, that practice goes way back, doesn't it? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I know that practice is... Uh, talking about the pharaoh, right? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I don't know if that's common. I don't think necessarily it's common with the population, but the pharaohs had that. Well, the pharaohs are setting themselves, if you're setting yourself apart as a god, you have to associate with other gods. I mean, right, right, yes. Um, up, up until recently, the, the royal Eng royal family in England are marrying commoners back back a century, even a century ago, they had to uh, marry other members of royalty. Oh, wow. Right. But what, what it's interesting is, uh, to, to, to the Greg's word, the Ramses, uh, um, you know, nickname was a bull because he had apparently 40 wives or 40 concubines, whatever you can call it. And he had over 50 or 60 kids or something like that. Yeah, and his, his nickname was the Royal Bull. <laughs> Basically mm, having, yeah. you know, well, I've, got, uh, appetite, yeah. I, I've got a collection of books by Richard Halliburton. I think he visited Arabia sometime in the 20s or the 30, 30s. And apparently, whoever was king at the time, even Saad, whoever it was, had something like 50 sons going around. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of... um, solid? No. All right. Uh... All right. Uh, hope everybody has a nice rest of the weekend. And thank you so much, Howard, for our presentation. Thanks for this general oh. discussion. Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. see you, uh, when I see you guys on either Roman, Mid yeah. Middle Eastern, European, or Ukrainian presentations coming up soon. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. uh, what what is it, Greg? May first, right? Or oh, May? No, I'm sorry, May, Mother's uh, Day, right? May second, uh, eighth, right? May eighth. I'm sorry, May eighth or Mother's Day. We'll do a Ukrainian uh, number three. We'll mo mostly going to talk about modern situation in Ukrainian conflict. So, hmm. 
to join us and I'll post that up soon. And then uh, we'll okay. is one of the panelists, you know, and uh, you know, we, it was really good. Thank you guys. Have a nice rest of the weekend. Thank you very much, everybody. Take Thank care. You.